Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Nimsch, and uh, I'm with Profamo. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity that Andrew gave me today to do a little talk on keg washing and filling and the kind of things you can do out there to make sure that your beautiful beer is packaged in the best possible way to bring your customers uh, the best experience. Um, I've been um, involved in the brewing industry since 1994, and uh, a big part of what we do at Profamo is, is keg related. Um, our company represents manufacturers of quality assurance, uh, keg washing and filling equipment, uh, dry hoppers, a variety of brewery optimization software packages. Um, but really the thing I've become known as as, a, as an expert in the field of kegging. And that really comes through looking at data from a variety of keg washers uh, that I've seen in my practice uh, over a number of years. Uh, it's gotten to the point where my wife actually calls me the keg man, which is a reference back to the Beatles song, Cuckoo Cuckoo, the egg man, but I'm the keg man. So um, I look forward to uh, trying to show you some uh, interesting things uh, about kegging. And one of the things I would very much appreciate is if during this presentation, since you can't shoot me a question directly, please put it in the comments section and I'll be really happy to answer as many of those as I can at the end of the talk. Uh, for those of you that I don't get to, or that have questions afterwards, please uh, contact me. Uh, I think you'll see my contact information during this presentation. Um, and I will be very pleased to touch base with you later. So uh, the other big thing I wanna do is give Andrew and uh, craft beer professionals a big shout out for giving me the opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, this is a fantastic forum for people to talk everything beer related. And, um, and please keep in mind that uh, you have this opportunity every Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock to uh, listen to somebody else give a chat on something that will be scintillating, I'm sure. So um, anyway, uh, that being said, um, let me start with a little presentation. Um, and then we'll jump from the presentation to um, some live data. So I'm now going to go and do a slideshow here for you. Hopefully you can see this. And um, I don't know if you're seeing my whole presentation um, or if you're also seeing the, the little preview on the side. Um, in any event, um, again, my name is Chris Nimsch. I'm with Profamo. And um, we uh, do as I said, a variety of different things, but our main focus is going to be on cleaning, sterilization, uh, filling of kegs. Um, let's go to the next slide. So the concept is, is that a keg is a um, sealed, pressurized black box. Uh, we don't really know what's going on in there. And um, it's hard to see through metal. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to show you a data logger uh, that will allow you to understand better uh, what's going on inside the keg, allow you to be a superman or superwoman and see what's going on inside the keg. Um, so rackers are, um, or keg washers come in a variety of different sizes, shapes, production uh, capabilities. Um, they... Um, uh, you know, we can talk everything from a very simple single head keg washer and then you manually fill kegs to a big keg line like this one uh, on the screen uh, that could produce up to 80 kegs per hour and multiples thereof. Um, but the concept is always the same, which is that um, you uh, really don't know what's going on either inside the kegs or with your keg racker unless you're looking at data from the only place that's important, which is inside the keg. So I'm gonna focus on steps three and four of the process, uh, uh, washing, uh, disinfection, sterilization for those of you that have high pressure steam and filling. Um, 
so uh, how do we do the Superman or Superwoman routine and look inside a keg? Well, there's a variety of different ways you can do it. There's something called a sight glass keg, which is a keg with a window on it and maybe a temperature sensor, maybe a pressure sensor. Uh, you also have an electronic test keg like the one I work with, which is called Rotec. And I'm going to delve into that data that you get from the electronic test keg in a great amount of detail. Um, as far as the um, uh, sight glass keg, that's what it looks like. That's a nice one. You've got a window. You can try and see if chemicals and rinse waters are spraying around inside the keg. Uh, you might see a temperature. You might see a pressure. Um, really, what we want to focus on is more along the lines of this electronic data keg that I'm showing you now. Um, in particular, this is what the inside of that keg would look like. Um, and to sort of do a little bit of a deep dive into that, uh, this is looking inside the electronic test keg I use, the Rotec keg. And we have in that keg three temperature sensors. Uh, one is located uh, in the barn's neck area of the keg down here. Um, it is um, um, uh, one millimeter away from the keg metal because we want to measure temperatures of gases and liquids. Uh, we have a second temperature sensor, which is in the middle of the keg, appropriately named the middle temperature sensor. And then we have a sensor at the top of the keg one millimeter away, again, from the keg metal. Uh, why do we measure temperature in three different places? Because when you are spraying a chemical into the keg to wash your keg, one of the great concerns is, is that chemical spraying evenly all over the walls of the keg? Is there a dedicated low pressure wash uh, of that chemical that's going to go and trickle down the spear? Again, the idea is you want to make sure that chemicals and rinses between chemicals are hitting all the walls of the keg evenly. If we have three temperature sensors inside the keg, what we do is at the end of a particular cycle, we will look at those temperatures and make sure they're the same at all three temperature sensors. If they are, we feel very confident that that particular chemical, or as I said, rinse water has sprayed evenly throughout the keg. If we see temperatures warmer in one part of the keg than the other, it makes us be a little bit concerned that maybe we're not spraying evenly everywhere inside the keg. Maybe we have an undersized pump that's pushing that liquid into the keg. Maybe we have a constriction in the pipe that's bringing that chemical to the keg washer, et cetera, et cetera. What else do we use three temperature sensors for? Well, things along the lines of, the, for you, those of you that use high pressure steam to sterilize your keg, if you have an even gradient of steam everywhere inside the keg, i.e. you have effectively purged all the air from the keg, you would accept, expect to see the same temperature steam at the top of the keg, the middle of the keg, and down at the neck or the valve area, the bottom of the keg. If you have residual air that's trapped in the keg during your steam sterilization step, you will see hotter temperatures at the top of the keg than the bottom because steam is hot and it rises and air is cool and it sinks. Um, during the filling, we also get some good information from the keg. A number of you I know are using uh, washers and then you manually fill your kegs. Um, so maybe of a little less interest, but for those that have automated machines that are dosing beer in um, with a mag flow meter or pressure controlled, uh, one of the things you'd want to do is you'd want to look at the end of your fill and see if you saw the same cold temperature of the beer at the top of the keg as you do in the middle and bottom of the keg. If you do, then that means that you filled beer up into the top one millimeter of the keg, and that's not good for your bottom line or the quality of the beer. Uh, kegs, like bottles and cans, should have a headspace, and uh, that's to protect the gas balance of the beer, to help you prevent from getting leaking kegs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so on the fill, that's one of the things we would look at. Also, 
when looking at fill data, we'd want to see if when the fill starts, as you can imagine, that keg is hot on the inside. Uh, when the cold beer comes into the keg, it hits our neck temperature or temperature sensor at the bottom of the keg first. So we see that go from hot to cold when the beer comes in. What ideally we'd like to see is that there is no beer foam that hits the middle temperature sensor when the fill starts. Uh, if we see the middle temperature sensor start to sag in temperature, then we feel that there may be foam inside the keg. That's beer loss, impacts the gas balance again. So something we'd like to avoid. Um, um, and then this is a representation of what we call a volume sensor. It's a ball that floats the length of this pipe and uses a Hall effect sensor to give us an idea of how much liquid is in the keg, uh, whether that be water, caustic, acid, beer, et cetera. Uh, we also measure the pressure inside the keg. And finally, on an automated machine, we have a little proximity sensor at the top of the keg that will tell us when there's a clamp coming down at a particular station of your kegger, um, and uh, we'll see all that data. All that data is collected from all of those sensors every one half second and goes up into a graph through infrared or Bluetooth. And uh, by reading that graph, uh, we then can get a feel for what's going on, as I said, in the only place that's important to you, which is inside the keg. Um, this graph shows you just very briefly what a Rotec graph looks like. Uh, I'm going to go in and show you live data. We'll be able to see it much better at that point. But in essence, what we're doing is we're tracking all of those different parameters we talked about over time. Um, and um, when on an automated keg, like, keg line like this one, uh, we do have different stations with clamps on them. Uh, we will show that as a black band at the bottom of the graph. Okay. I'll go into this in more detail, as I said, later with the live software. Um, the kinds of things that the data from an electronic test keg will help you with, uh, we're looking at not only the washing side, and it can be something, as I said, as simple as, are we hitting all the walls of the keg with the solutions that we want to at the correct temperature? And that's something I'm going to go back to again later is it's very important for you to work with your supplier of chemicals to know what the ideal temperature ranges are for the various disinfection, disinfectants you're using. And um, also to be able to validate with them what kind of tests you need to do to make sure that those chemicals are working as efficiently for you as possible. Are you checking your pH? Are you checking your caustic activity? And how do you do that, et cetera? Um, and then, as I said, we will look at data on the fill cycles as well. Um, and um, then we also have things along the lines of engineering problem solving. So some of my customers will use the data from the electronic keg, optimize their keg lines fully in cooperation with the manufacturer of that keg line, will then save that data as their ideal graph. And then one day if they have a problem with micros or uh, oxygen pickup, et cetera, uh, they can actually superimpose the problem graph on top of the ideal graph and that will allow you to be able to try and hone in on where the problem is. So as I say to my customers, you literally have no idea how to solve a problem unless you know what your problems are and kegs are black boxes. So we need a way to look inside that keg once we see the problem then we put our heads together and find out how to solve those problems. And typically what I suggest is that when you are making changes to a keg line, you make one change at a time and then validate if that is correcting the issue. Don't make multiple changes. You'll get confused, or at least I will. And uh, you're best to do it in that way. Um, for those of you that are wanting to keep records of how well your keg line's working, it's a beautiful thing to be able to go back and refer to uh, data that you've kept. Uh, should you ever get a complaint from trade, you can say, no, no, when that keg left our facility, uh, our keg washer and filler was working <clears throat> as well as it can. Uh, maybe we have an issue with uh, storing the kegs uh, warm, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and then we can look at things like process improvement on big keg lines, even on smaller ones you wanna do 
things to make them work as efficiently as possible, wash as many kegs per hour as you can, fill as many as you can, and also reduce your use of utilities. Um, let's try and be as sustainable as possible. Um, those are some examples of the kinds of things we can see with this data. <clears throat> My customers often, uh, we do an initial training session, <clears throat> and then they uh, reach out to me. They'll send me data. We'll do a Zoom session or a team session and look at the data together. And at a certain point, um, these customers feel very comfortable analyzing the data, but I'm always there for as long as is necessary to try and do the deep dive with you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about high pressure steam. I know a lot of you may not have that in your breweries. Uh, if you do, I think it's a wonderful thing. It's a great sleep at night factor. Uh, you use your chemicals to disinfect kegs, but steam, uh, if at under the right conditions, i.e. it's wet steam or saturated steam, it's held in the keg for at least one minute at a temperature of at least 275 degrees Fahrenheit then you have assured that you have sterilized your keg. Um, that's something that we can tell from the data very easily. And again, I'll show you some examples of some suboptimal uh, sterilization procedures and uh, an optimal one as well. Um, a quick thing that is really creating a lot of buzz in the industry these days for those of you that are using high pressure steam or are considering it, uh, a lot of people are talking about instead of using plant steam, which obviously chemicals transfer across into your kegs, to instead use a clean steam generator. Uh, it's not inexpensive, but uh, certainly you'll be uh, very uh, assured of the fact that you are only putting uh, clean steam in your kegs, no chemicals. Um, this is an example of what I would call an excellent disinfection, very close to a sterilization. This particular brewery has 80 seconds of hold time with high pressure saturated steam. Uh, when you see pink lines on a Rotec graph, you can maybe see it here a little bit. That denotes saturated steam. Uh, we have an embedded steam table built into the software so that when we see those conditions for wet steam, uh, we will change the typical colors of black, red, and green for the three temperatures to pink. Um, the only issue here was that uh, they weren't quite reaching the 275 degrees. And again, this might be hard to see, maybe because of my split screen that I'm seeing. I hope you're seeing the full screen. But um, So they're only 270 degrees. And what we would like to do ideally in this situation is just increase steam pressure up to about 33 to 35 PSI. And that will get you to 275 degrees Fahrenheit, which is where we want to be. This is the kind of data I see more often than not, unfortunately, where a brewery's uh, steam is not optimal. They have a lot of air inside the keg while they're steaming it. Uh, we're hitting uh, lower temperatures as a result, uh, only getting up to a maximum of about 249 degrees Fahrenheit. And as you can see from the two temperature lines being split here, uh, where we have hotter temperatures in the middle of the keg than at the bottom of the keg. That's a clear indicator of air inside the keg during the steam hold. That's a simple fix to correct that if you know you have that problem. Uh, but if you can't see inside the keg, you don't know you have the problem. The way to fix it is very simple. All you do is you open up the valve on the keg and you blow steam through the keg for long enough to remove all the air. That time really depends on uh, the size of the package you're using. A half barrel keg will take at least seven seconds of steam blow through. Uh, a six stole is about one third that time. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about in the live software, again, particularly of interest for those of you that use chemicals to do your disinfection, at the end of any wash or rinse, you would like to see all temperatures reach the same temperature everywhere inside the keg. This is an example of that uh, where we're seeing the bottom, top, and middle temperatures all at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this is, I'm just going to show you a quick picture of inside the keg. Um, this is uh, more of interest for those of you that have 
bigger machines where there's actually a dedicated uh, step in the process to holding hot caustic in the keg. Um, that is also done typically for a period of about 60 seconds. Why are we doing that? Because the extractor valve is a place that has a lot of little hidden nooks and crannies, good places for micros to hang out. And so what we do is uh, we recommend if the machine provides for it, put in enough hot caustic to fully cover that valve. Uh, unfortunately, I see too many cases where breweries don't put in enough caustic. And then we're kind of missing the whole point of that step. So you need at least half a, half a gallon of hot caustic to cover the valve and the spear on a half barrel size keg, obviously less than a smaller diameter sixthal. Uh, that would be something that we would look at on the data uh, that we're, we would collect at your brewery. Um, other breweries don't have that. Uh, their machines are just doing cycles of pulsed uh, uh, chemicals and uh, rinse waters. Uh, one of the things that we notice very often is that there are large pools collecting inside the keg. That's really not good cleaning practice. We want to have liquids go in and out of kegs. Uh, don't want to have them sit around for long, except, as I said on that prior slide, where that whole purpose is to soak the valve and the spear. Um, but um, if you have more liquid sitting around in the keg, uh, it obviously takes more pressure to blow that out. So again, we're all about sustainability. We're all about using less compressed air. I live in California. Certainly here, we want to use the least amount of rinse water possible. Obviously, we want to, you know, make sure our kegs are clean, but we don't want to waste utilities either. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of slides now, which is at a big brewery, the way they collect their micros. Um, you may do it differently. What I can tell you, it's a long and arduous process, and you have to wait around to be able to see what the results of your tests are. Whereas if you know that, um, that you are um, um, uh, washing properly, um, then uh, you can uh, uh, just continue with your process as you see it. Um, uh, the way you would know that is obviously if you were collecting data from inside the keg uh, and confirming immediately whether or not your cleaning processes were sufficient, coupled with, as I said, doing the necessary tests as suggested by your chemical supplier uh, to confirm that your chemicals are working as well as they can. I'm going to quickly jump into uh, the fill side of things. Um, this is an example of a good fill. Uh, I won't get in too much into the details of this now um, because I'm going to show you some live data soon. Um, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to go back here to this. Uh, my apologies. There we go. I hit the wrong button. Um, so that's a fill. We're going to look at it in more detail. Um, this is a fill with problems. Um, this particular case, um, this brewery was packaging steam in with their kegs during the fill. And uh, I noticed uh, that there was steam inside the keg as the fill started. Uh, there was a lot of foaming going on. And what I did was I advised the packaging manager of what I saw. They really didn't believe it. So I said, well, let's prove it. Let's get a dissolved oxygen meter and measure what's going on inside the keg if we can see oxygen. And... Uh, Certainly, uh, I was uh, very relieved, uh, they weren't, but I was, uh, that they were picking up 1,700 parts per billion of dissolved oxygen because they had lost their CO2 purge. That keg was going straight from a keg filled with steam to filling with beer. And so that steam was entrapped in the beer. And uh, as I said, uh, just uh, probably the worst fill I've ever seen. Um, for those of you that are manually filling your kegs, the one thing I will tell you is that you are filling right to the tippy top. You are brim filling your kegs uh, unless you slant them. So a very simple way of trying to give yourself some headspace in the keg um, without, uh, you know, having a full mag flow meter or otherwise is if you can place your kegs on a pallet, put a wedge under that pallet and, uh, and then fill it. Uh, as soon as you see a beer starting to come out uh, because of the slant, 
uh, you know you at least have some headspace rather than no headspace. Um, I'll show you a couple more slides and then we'll get to the live data. Um, those are the examples of the kinds of things that we do when we go into a brewery um, and what, uh, what an electronic data keg is used for. Um, this uh, is a couple of case studies from some well-known breweries. Uh, Sierra Nevada was an early adopter of our technology. Up in Chico, they have a keg line with four lanes. And uh, although they're very adept at reading their data, uh, they asked me if I could help them at one point because they were seeing something kind of strange, which is on one of the lanes, uh, they were seeing micros occasionally, uh, not always, occasionally. So I said, please send me your data from the lane where you see the problem. Send me the data from a lane where you never see the problem and I'll superimpose them on top of each other, which is what I did. And what was very nice is that the data really matched up pretty well, except for this area here. And I zoomed in on it. The software allows me to do that and I'll show that to you later. And what we saw was, um, is that they were venting the keg after their steam hold for longer on that one lane. And um, again, very hard to see probably because of my split screen stuff, but uh, they were approaching ambient pressure. So what we surmised was some days they would go slightly negative at this point. And after steaming of the keg, all we're doing is we're purging with CO2, we're filling with beer. So if we do indeed pull a little bit of a vacuum, we're going to suck back into that keg, uh, dirty liquid or dirty air, and now we're filling on top of it. So the fix was very simple. Once we saw the data, we could fix it. And that just meant reducing the amount of time we vented uh, the keg on the problem lane. Uh, problem went away. Uh, a good time to be able to look at data is uh, when you're commissioning a, a new keg line. Um, so uh, some manufacturers um, uh, will provide you with uh, uh, data from a, a test keg when they commission the machine. That's what we do, uh, we believe in that very highly. I would prefer for you to reach out to me when you're getting a keg line uh, rather than a year or two later and you go, you know what, we've been having, having these little niggling problems and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we'd like to try and solve it. Well, the only way you can solve it is by seeing data inside the keg line. So commissioning keg lines, great time to do it. Uh, here's another example, Russian River. The last one was Victory. Uh, Russian River. Uh, hired me to go up uh, with my keg. And uh, again, what we saw in this particular case was, uh, first of all, a poor steaming of the keg uh, on commissioning and also a carryover of steam during the fills. Uh, that was exactly the right time to do it because the technician was there, reprogramming was done, and we made that machine the best it could possibly be. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to go just quickly put up my information. You can note that um, if you'd like to reach out to me afterwards. And now I'm going to go uh, to show you some live data. Okay, so let me close this down. So hopefully you can see that. Um, what I have up on the screen is data from our electronic data keg. Uh, this is an example of a keg washer only situation, which probably applies to most of you. Um, this is a um, machine um, that is washing with uh, water and caustic and sanitizer. And then the keg is prepared at the end of the washing cycle with a certain pressure inside the keg so it can be manually filled. Um, so when we look at these graphs, what we want to see is basically uh, the summary feature up here in the top left-hand corner. This tells us the pressure is shown as the purple line. Uh, the temperature at the bottom of the keg or the neck is shown in black. The middle temperature sensor shown in red. Top temperature in green. And contents shown as this aquamarine color. So what do we see here? Well, one of the things that it shows also is a summary of what the maximum values and minimum values are that we see on whatever particular portion of the graph we're looking at. So I'm going to zoom in on where the caustic is supposed to be coming into the keg. And what jumps out at me is that we only got to a temperature of about 118 degrees Fahrenheit. 
this particular machine uh, uh, has a display on the front of it that indicates that we should be dosing caustic in at a temperature of 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So why are we seeing temperatures that don't match that 150? Well, if I look at the data at this particular point where the caustic's coming in, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but I have this data values box here on the side. As I move this red vertical line around, I'm able to see what the pressure temperatures are, how much liquid's in the keg. And for whatever reason, there was an extremely small amount of caustic coming into the keg. We should have had about a gallon of caustic coming in, but really the maximum I see from my data is about 0.1 gallons. So was the caustic tank empty? Was there some sort of a constriction? I don't know what it was, but what it did show us is the only place that saw the caustic at all was at the bottom of the keg, the neck temperature. It got to 108 degrees Fahrenheit there and a little bit hotter earlier on in the process. So what does that tell me? It tells me the caustic was not spraying evenly, vigorously everywhere inside the keg. It was only trickling down to the bottom of the keg. The middle and the top of the keg never saw those temperatures. And would you have known that otherwise? I'm not sure. I mean, some people go and they'll put their hand on the side of the keg to see, to see what uh, is going on, but um, some don't. And so you just process that keg. You think it was fine because the machine didn't fault out, but clearly there was an issue. So I'm guessing that particular brewery may have seen some micros. Even though they did do a sanitizer at the end, that's the sanitizer here, room temperature. Uh, coming into the keg. Uh, that's my aqua, aquamarine uh, bump here. Uh, and then the final step on this particular machine is pressure going up at time 267 seconds. The purple line goes up. That's CO2 coming in to the keg to push out that sanitizer. The question is, does one CO2 purge remove all of the sanitizer and all of the air that was entrapped in the keg? Uh, with this particular keg washer, it's a pretty ubiquitous one seen in a lot of breweries. I often see uh, brewers, instead of just doing one CO2 purge, they'll do two, three, four, and there's even a brewery in San Diego that I saw did up to 10 uh, in order to keep their dissolved oxygens as low as possible. Because obviously, if you're not getting all the air out of the keg with CO2, that air is hanging around and it's just waiting for the beer to come into the keg um, to, uh, to impact it. Let's go to a next graph. Um, so hopefully you see this one now. Um, so this is the same machine, um, but what they did is they added some extra programming to do some more rinses. We see more blurps of liquid inside the keg. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in this case. Here we see a very robust increase in temperatures uh, getting to our 150 degrees Fahrenheit, more or less. Uh, in this case, instead of the 0.1 U.S. gallons, uh, they had 0.63 U.S. gallons uh, pooling inside the keg of caustic. Uh, one of the things, as I told you to look at, is are all the temperatures getting to the same temperature at the end of any particular wash or rinse? And the answer is they get pretty close. Uh, we're a, a little bit hotter at the top of the keg than we are in the neck and in the middle, uh, but generally not bad. Um, the one thing I would say about this particular data set is does this brewery need to do one, two, three, four uh, different uh, water rinses? Each water rinse is coming in at about uh, 0.8 US gallons. That's a lot of water to be used to wash a keg. Uh, let's have a look at what's happening at the end of this cycle. Um, as I told you, uh, we see breweries do more than one CO2 purge. So they're doing one purge, two purge, three purge, four purge. And at the end of the cycle, that keg leaves the washer with a residual CO2 pressure in there of about 12.8 PSI, which that brewery told me was a good level for them um, because um, uh, they're filling with the static pressure off of a bright tank. And um, um, that seems to work well for them. If you get into a more automated uh, 
keg line, you might end up having a VFD pump uh, that's driving the beer <clears throat> to your keg filler under constant pressure, which will help you reduce foaming and things along those lines. Uh, I'm now going to jump ahead to the next slide. This is an example of a more automated machine. Uh, maybe some of you have something like this. this. This is a keg washer and filler now. We're doing both sides of the process. And as you can see from all this pink and high temperatures here in the middle of the graph, uh, we also are steaming the keg with high pressure saturated steam to sterilize it. Um, so let's uh, let's zoom in quickly on um, on what's going on on the first station, which is the washing station. I know that because there's a black band here. I'll quickly jump back out and show you this white band. That's where the keg is transferring from the washing and steaming head to the filling head. Uh, here's the washing head and the washing head. What we what we notice is all of these rinses are very vigorous. Temperatures get to the same here with this mixed water recovery rinse. Uh, let me make that a little bit bigger so you can see it. Uh, here's our hot caustic coming in. All the temperatures get up, up to about the same. I would query if 182 degrees Fahrenheit is not too hot. Typically, I don't see caustic above 172. Uh, there's a water rinse snuck in here. This would be acid, acid temperatures about 170 five or so. Again, I would query if that's a little bit too hot. Hot water rinse. And then if I go full screen here, this is now my steam sterilization step. I'm getting to temperatures at 276 degrees Fahrenheit, which allows me to sterilize the keg as long as I hold it in the keg for the 60 seconds, which I'm doing. Uh, I have pink line saturated steam. So I've gone ahead and I've disinfected, sanitized the keg here and now I really can rest assured that I've done everything I need to do to make sure I'm putting beer in a sterilized keg by steaming it properly. Uh, the next step in the process is now the filling head. If I zoom in on that, we see that what's happening is uh, we're venting the steam out of the keg. One of the critical control points I always look at when I'm looking at data is I'll take my uh, data tracker bar to this point in the graph this is where the black line goes shooting down and my aquamarine line starts coming up. That's where the beer fill starts. And um, that's a critical point because one of the things we want to make sure has occurred here is that we were able to remove all the steam from the keg. How do we know that? Well, we look at temperatures right at that point when the beer starts coming into the keg. And if any of those are above what is sort of the normal temperature of steam at sea level, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, we will be concerned that maybe we haven't removed all the steam from the keg. There might be a little fraction left over. Now, this particular data is almost ideal. We're only getting slightly above 212 at the middle of the keg. Uh, and so that would result in a very small carryover of steam, which turns to condensate, i.e. water in your beer. Um, Certainly, we look for much worse situations than that. I think I've got an example coming up. Um, but we could correct that just by venting the keg a little bit longer, allowing more steam to leave, and or uh, purging with CO2 for maybe another extra half second. And that's one of the reasons that you always want to do that work of looking at the data so that you can actually tweak based on half seconds. You're not taking big guesses, you know, exactly the situation. Um, my middle temperature sensor, that's a sensor in the middle of the keg. It stays flat until the beer comes up to hit it. That means there's no foaming. And then one of the other things I look at is at the end of the fill, I'll just move this out of the way a little bit. Uh, we look to see what is the pressure inside the keg. Here we're at 25 PSI. That's a good value. Somewhere between 15 and 30 is where we want to be. And also uh, we look at the temperature at the top of the keg, as I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, that's important because if it's hotter like it is here, uh, then we feel very confident that we have headspace in the keg. Uh, if that temperature was more approaching the 40, 42 degrees that we see of the other two temperature sensors that are submerged in beer, that's bad. We've overfilled the keg. Okay. Uh, quickly, let me just show you a not so good example. 
of a same kind of machine. Uh, I'm not going to focus too much on the washes on the wash side. They're pretty good, except for that same thing again, where the caustic might be too hot at 185 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, <clears throat> this particular brewery did not activate the residual pressure check uh, on the keg line. I always recommend you do that. What does that mean? It means that any keg that comes in uh, at a pressure of less than four PSI or so should not be washed, should not be filled. It should be inspected. Why? Because maybe it's got a bad seal on it. Why? Because there are nasty people in the world that do things like putting sand in kegs and mice and tire irons and gas, you name it. And if they did that, that means that they put the valve out, which is extremely dangerous to do. And, uh, and there's no pressure inside the keg. So I highly recommend you do that. Um, but I'm going to focus on the second head, which is, in this case, uh, the washing and, or this, I'm sorry, the steaming and filling head. I don't like this concept. Uh, I don't like it for a few reasons. One is, I believe the kegs on a two-head machine should be steamed on the first head. That allows you to hold steam for 60 seconds. This keg line does not allow you to do it. There's just not enough contact time with steam. Um, we only have about 190 to maybe here, uh, maybe 13 seconds. That's not enough to sterilize the keg. Our steaming cycle has all sorts of problems. But the bigger issue is it's very hard to get all that steam out of the keg now. And so if I go to that same critical control point I talked about before and I move my data tracker here, you can see we're not at 214 as we were on the other keg line. We're at 260, 262, 258. That keg is full of steam. It's so full of steam when the, when the beer fill starts that we actually see those pink lines, which represents saturated steam inside the keg as, as the fill starts. And of course, what happens there is that steam cools down, it condenses, turns into water. So you're packaging water in with your beer. Best case scenario, worst case scenario is you're packaging water. And on top of that, your boiler water is not treated. And now you're adding a whack load of oxygen to your beer. In this particular case, this was 700 parts per billion. And um, that's something you definitely want to avoid. Um, and at the end of the fill, in this case, um, this brewery, that keg came off with a pressure of 54 PSI, um, which is uh, going to lead to very wild pours in the tap room. It's going to impact the gas balance in your beer because uh, you've got so much CO2 packed into the headspace. Uh, I'm just about to take your questions in about one minute. Uh, I'm just going to quickly show you an example of a bigger keg line. Uh, this is one that can process up to 60 kegs an hour. Um, I like this process very much. Um, we are not only washing with uh, hot water, caustic, hot water, acid, uh, and sterilizing with steam, but also we're doing this caustic soak that I talked about. Uh, we have 0.94 gallons of caustic at a temperature of 147 degrees. That's soaking the valve in the keg. We have more than enough time to sterilize the keg. And uh, we have excellent quality saturated steam at the right temperature. And then finally, when we go to our fills, uh, we can validate that all of our temperatures are below uh, the temperature of steam and uh, no foaming, good end pressure, um, and, um, and we have a nice headspace in the keg. So what I'm going to do now, if it's okay with you, I've covered a lot of stuff and I apologize for that. I'm going to go and see if there's any questions that you have for me and I'll be de delighted to, uh, to look at those. So I'm going to stop sharing now, I presume. And let me get out of my presentation. Okay, I'm here. So let's see if I have any questions for me. And I don't see any right now, um, but certainly if you have some, please leave them in the comments section for me. And I would be very happy to, uh, to answer those. Um, and as I said, if you have questions that you'd like to send me later, um, I'm very open to do that. Please reach out to me either by phone. My phone number is 941-284-7990 or you can email me at chris, C-H-R-I-S, 
at profamo, P-R-O-F-A-M-O dot com. And I would look forward to, uh, to speaking with you. So I'll just look and see if there's any comments or questions that come up. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sean. I appreciate it. Uh, is there an angle that's best? Uh, so Sean is asking Sean West, is there an angle that's best for manual filling? So that's referring to that slide I showed with putting some sort of a wedge under a pallet. Uh, I don't know of anybody that's done that work yet. What I would suggest to you is that obviously on a keg like a half barrel that has a wider diameter, you can slant the keg much more. You'll have more stability to do that than you would with a six stole. As far as um, how much to slant, uh, one of the things that uh, you should keep in mind is that there is no spec uh, other than good industry practices for low fills on kegs. And therefore, I would suggest uh, that you are better off to have a higher headspace in the keg than a lower one. Uh, I think in the range of 3 to 5% is very normal. And, and as I said, uh, is the best way of doing it. But certainly, if any of you would be interested in doing that work, uh, and analyzing what's the maximum angle and uh, what kind of headspace you're getting, uh, that would be fantastic. And that would be, I think, a super uh, talk to give at a future uh, CBC uh, or uh, Master Brewers or ASBC show. So, Sean, thank you very much for that. Uh, Evan Stewart is asking me, what are your thoughts on recycle recyclable pet kegs? Uh, fantastic. Um, that technology has come a long way. Uh, I have uh, heard from the industry that obviously there's a lot of variability in those kinds of kegs. Um, one of the things that I will tell you is that uh, make sure that you line up the kind of PET keg uh, that you're going to fill with whatever filler you're using. Some fillers cannot deal with those PET kegs that have an internal bladder inside of them, um, but otherwise... Uh, uh, you certainly can go ahead and just fill those. Some of our customers that are doing, you know, up to 160 kegs per hour with our keg lines are just using them in some cases to fill PETs. Obviously, there's some programming changes that need to be made to the machine so that the plunger doesn't come down with excessive pressure and impact the keg. Also, we want to fill at slightly different pressures. Uh, but the technology, as I understand, is very good. I don't know of any recent... Uh, doctrine related to oxygen pickup, but as I understand, that's all excellent. Thanks for that question, Evan, and I hope I answered it for you. And if there's something I missed or something else you'd like to discuss, uh, please let me know. So at this point, I'm just uh, waiting for your questions and uh, uh, I am available. And if there's nothing, then uh, certainly we'll uh, uh, look forward to you reaching out in the future and seeing if there's maybe some opportunities. What I tend to do is um, when I'm traveling around the country, I will bring one of our electronic data kegs along. And I find very often that uh, if, I, if you don't know me or you don't know the technology, I'll show up, knock on your door and say, hey, I've got this keg in the back of my car that will tell you just about everything you want to know about your keg washer and filler. And I generally get one of two reactions. One is, oh, fantastic. I'd love to see you. Please come in and I'll be there from, you know, between 20 minutes and four hours. Or uh, sometimes people just say, uh, I don't think I really want to know. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, people realize that their keg washers aren't really doing an ideal job for them. Um, but optimization opportunities are always available. And I have found that most manufacturers are very keen to sit down and do some sort of a Zoom session or team session, look at the data with you, and it may help them analyze how they can make their machines better. Wait for more questions.
Let's see if I have any more new new questions. Um, so if I don't uh, have any more questions from you, I will just uh, at this point sign off and uh, and thank all of you uh, for your time today. And again, thank Andrew. Whoops, I got one more question. Um, they just came up. Any thoughts on the AAA keg washer? Uh, I don't know what the AAA keg washer is, uh, but certainly I'd be very happy to collect some data on that machine. So if you tell me, Ross, uh, where you are, I'm happy to come in and uh, and look if you have that machine or also feel free to have the manufacturer reach out to me and i'm very pleased to go off and and look at them and and work with them to uh, to try and optimize it as much as possible as i said my my situation is one that i wear a lot of different hats i also sell keg washers and fillers and i think they're pretty darn good um, but uh, i understand that they may not be uh, in the budget for everybody and my goal is to help everyone uh, be able to use their equipment in the best way possible and optimize what they have. And, uh, and I'm very happy also to work with the uh, units that we compete against in order to optimize their machines. Uh, because the only person that's important to me in this whole equation is you, the brewer. And I want to make sure you're uh, packaging your beer the best way possible. Um, so as I said, if, um, if there are no more questions, uh, I will sign off shortly and, um, and I will look forward to hearing from those of you uh, that have questions in the future. And once again, a big, big thanks to Andrew and the folks at the Craft Beer Professionals uh, for giving me this opportunity and, uh, to, and thank you for doing the great work you do for the craft beer community. And I hope to see you all in Minneapolis next year at the Craft Brewer Show or other shows. And as I said, hope to meet you in person somewhere. All the best at this point. I'll sign off. Thank you very much.